you've joined a very special Sister to Sister today, we have a question like this. Is there good in everyone? There's good in you. I sure hope so. I got a testimony. Flow Stay testimony. Tuned. special show. We have testimony time with Flo in our second segment. But if you've never joined us before, you are going to enjoy this. We are five opinionated women of God and you send us questions and we answer those questions from the Word of God and mostly from in our hearts. So this first question is really good and, and it applies to everyone. You too. Listen to what it is. It says, and you sent it, thanks a lot. You said, do you, sisters, believe there is good in everyone? Hmm. This is a really important question because there is a lot of evil in the world. Yes. And there's a lot of bad, hard, um, terror, destruction. There's a lot of evil. So have we lost hope? For instance, you know, if there's, if there's, is there good and if they're just bad, why should I even pray for them? Why should I even believe in them? Um, I was just at a conference with uh, Dr. Caroline Lee for several days, and she was taking us all back to the garden. And she's been studying the mind and brain for 35 years. So back in the garden, the scripture in Genesis 1, 26 says this, Then God said, Let us, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, make man in our image according to our likeness, not physical, but a spiritual personality and moral likeness, and let him have complete authority over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over the entire earth. So what she said, and I believe it's so true, that to the core of you, you are good, because he is good. And if you're made in the image and likeness of God, then you are good. The problem is there's different life experiences. There are environments that we're in. There are things we're listening to. There are choices that we're making that affect our life. And so evil, the darkness is going to come and try to take you out. But to your very core, there is good. So if you're struggling with, should I still pray for them? Should I still believe in them? I would say absolutely yes. They are God's kids created in his image and like never give up on them. Well, here's the thing. You said that, that people should know that we were created in the image of God and there we are in the Garden of Eden. But there's people that believe they came from a little amoeba. Yes, that's so, a whole different. <laughs> I know that's different, but it's in, but in general, there, in general, there is such darkness yeah. covering half of us. So do we believe that there's good in everyone? Saying that, yes, they all came from God is a good thought. Probably we should all go back to Genesis and read from the very, very beginning how mm -hmm. God created man and woman and said, come together, have a family, be fruitful, multiply, and take dominion. Genesis would solve a lot of the world's problems right yes. now. Yes, <laughs> if we could get them to read it, that would be really good. <laughs> what do you think? Is there good in everyone? You know, I was listening to Corey talk about this, and I, I think she artic articulates it a whole lot better than me. So I'm oh, gonna let her speak. you're passing? I'm passing. <laughs> oh. Okay. Is there good in everyone, Corey? Well, first of all, I, I always, I wanna start with this. There's inherent value in every single life. I think that that needs to be said first and foremost. Um, but when it comes to good in everyone, I think there's potential for good in every single person. I mean, from the best of the best to the worst of the worst. Who's the worst you can think of, Kathy? Hitler. Okay, Hitler. Hitler. I think Hitler was the worst of the bad. I mean, yeah, when you dude. think of a bad example, yeah. yes, that comes to mind. And yes, I think there was potential even for good in Hitler. Like you said, there's choices people make and what paths they take. But 
you know, in our culture right now, there's, I think there's this like whole mindset where it's like, I think everyone's basically good. <laughs> and I just don't agree with that. I mean, we are, we're all born with a sin right. nature. Yes, and so are. I just, I just think the opposite. Like, I think we're not all mostly basically good. I think we're all basically bad. <laughs> I fight that sin nature every single day. I'm not speaking for all of you, but I know I personally am fighting that every day. So the, exactly, yes, Paul, yes. The, I am the worst of sinners, right? Is what he said. I, I fight that every day. And the only reason that I am not bad is because I got Jesus in my heart, okay? That's, I mean, to say like, we're all basically good. No, like we're bad and Jesus can make it right, okay? And I'm gonna mess up, but you know who makes it clean again? Jesus. Well, you know what you said that about the Paul? That's so interesting because mm -hmm. I wonder what he was doing. I mean, I'm sorry, but Paul says it's in Romans, right? Mm -hmm. Where does he say it? I don't know. <laughs> I, want sure to know. I want to do good, but the good in me, uh, I do bad, I right. choose right. bad I instead good. of good, right. because right. that is the sinful nature she was That's talking right. about. Right. In the garden, God made everything, saw that it was good. Then Adam chose to sin, disobey God, and sin entered into the world. Mm -hmm. And the scripture says, by one man sin entered, mm -hmm. and by one man Christ, yep. we became righteous. So we distinguish between goodness and righteousness. The Bible says, no, not one is righteous, Romans 3.10. Mm -hmm. We have all come short yes. of God's glory, but Christ in us is the hope of Amen. glory. Amen. Right. Amen. But Roxy, can you tell me that I always had, a, I was confused about this. Um, I'm righteous, I'm self-righteous. Right. Totally different. Tell me. Self-righteousness is sinful. You cannot in yourself save yourself. Righteousness comes from Christ and the work that Jesus did on the cross for us. Okay, well, do you Ooh. think that we, <laughs> all of us and all of them, are we good enough? We're never going to be good enough on our own because Christ in us, as I said, is the hope of glory. But God says, God is at work in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. We are his workmanship created to do good works, right. not be good enough but do good works that, what's it say? He has ordained before. God already decided and determines. He says, I've got all these good works for you to walk in. Will you please walk oh, in them? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we have a choice. We do have a choice. That's do we want to walk in those good works? Do we want to pray? Mm -hmm. Do we want to humble ourselves when, when something goes wrong? Do we want to cause our, our life to turn to Christ or turn to evil. Yeah. Well, that's what Corey said. She sins every day. Mm -hmm. I didn't say I sinned every day. Well, you kind of said that. Well, that's I said, Corey, I'll I say it for you. I <laughs> sin every day. So I die daily. That's that's the word of God. I've been that's made right. righteous through his righteousness. That's so, right. That's right. I mean, that's just the way it goes. Amy, do you think that we are good enough? Yes. I mean, like, like Roxy said, ditto. You know, we are not good enough. But we do live in a region of the world where um, it's a lot about our religion is about our works, you know? So okay. can I do enough confessions? Can I do enough Hail Marys? Can I do, light enough candles? Can I go to enough services? Like at what point am I good, good enough? At what point am I walking with God? At what point am I religious? At what point am I righteous? The fact is you can do all the works you want, but without Jesus, I mean, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. He took all of our bad and gave us all of his good. That's so good. good. And I'm so glad you sent this question. It was kind of hard, I thought. And I just know this, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I can go to the next question on this one. Okay, you wrote this to us too. I don't know what you're doing out there, but we're so grateful. Um, here's what you said. Where do you draw the line between helping people and then showing them how to help themselves, right? So how do you strike that balance? And I'm sure that you're all helpers of people. I am. 
I know you are. Well, this is the biggest thing I'm facing right now in the stage of parenting that I'm in. Mm. So I know this is a general question about helping people, but right. right now, this is like totally what I'm facing because I have teenagers and a young adult in, in my parenting stage. And it's honestly my biggest regret in my parenting. So I try to pass this down to like younger parents is that don't step in so much. Like, Honestly, I regret that so much that I haven't allowed my children to kind of even ask for help. I think that's, you know, as moms especially, where we step in so quickly, we're not, we train our kids to not even ask for help. Mm. You know, and even other people, you can carry this over from parenting into other areas of the world. Like, like we train people in our lives to not even ask for help. Like people have to learn to ask and you know, our kids especially. They don't even know how to ask for help. And then we're like, why are the young adults in our lives not asking for help? Because they have no idea how to. Because you've literally stepped in for every single thing in their life. And now they're like, uh, I need help. I don't know how to ask. Yeah. So I think that's something I'm learning now, yeah. but it's, they're facing much bigger consequences in their life. Well, so I wrote that down. So I hope yeah. you write that down too. Mm -hmm. Don't step in so much. And it doesn't mean never helping them, right. but it me it, it's learning how to help them in a way where you're walking beside them, mm -hmm. maybe That's giving right. them um, examples of a dialogue to have, providing them with here's a phone number to call. Mm -hmm. um, let me. It's, it's not doing it for them, but coming alongside yeah. them to help them. That's it's not it. cutting That's off the good. aid, but walking beside them. Okay. You know, from the, I'm sorry. Go ahead. From, from the ministry standpoint, I was thinking, you know, Corey, I, for me, ladies, I've, I've seen myself just hit battle fatigue, weariness, yeah. because mm -hmm. you're so busy pouring out and you don't mm -hmm. allow yourself time to be poured into. Mm -hmm. And so um, what is that, you know, that healthy balance? And you guys know that's like yeah, my that's key word, balance, 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 right. balance, right. balance right. you know. Right. Um, and I think for me, it's when I feel myself getting drained, when people start looking at me like how they should be looking at God, that then that true. tells me mm -hmm. I've pointed them to me and my counsel and my That's wisdom good, yeah. and not the wisdom of God. That's because when true. you lift him up, he draws all men unto him. Mm -hmm. So if I am maybe not intentionally, you know, um, but there are times that when you are in ministry, the way that we deliver things, the way that we interact, you become the person's answer. You guys heard me time and yeah. time again yes. say, don't try to be junior Holy Ghost. Yeah. You know what right. I mean? Like God is God all by God himself. So I need yes. to point you in that di direction. Yes. Um, it is very uh, exhausting um, when you, people begin to look at you in such a manner that they feel all their answers come from you, yes. um, all the solutions. Also, I think you need to know your strengths, you know? Mm -hmm. Like, I got all types of certifications in counseling. I don't counsel. <laughs> I don't. And people laugh, they go, Flo, you don't, no, 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 no. Honey, after you talk to me three times, and you haven't applied what I told you the first time, Go we're right. done. Go that's for right. it. Like we're that. done. Okay. Now, okay. I do have people that I refer people to. Yes. Mm. Because that's just, it's just not my strength. Sure. You know, yes. it's, it's a grace. I don't have to hear you tell me the same thing five times. And I'm not making a mockery of yeah. it because people do need that. Listen, I'm, I'm one of them. But... I don't have that grace. Well, I need a scripture from you on this. Well, you know, Titus 2 says, be a model mm, yeah, of good works good. and sound yeah. speech. Yeah. So what's a model? I want to distinguish here what the sisters are saying. One is doing good works. One is being a disciple. Oh, that's, good. that's good. You've got to decide, are you going to be committed? And is that person going to be that's committed, good. as Flo said, that's to good. be a disciple? There's difference between giving somebody something and discipling them, being a model for them, bringing them alongside of you. And it, it's so diametrically opposed to one another mm -hmm. because a disciple has a commitment. Jesus had 5,000 people listen to him. How many disciples did he have? Right. Right. 12. Yeah. Right. He right. sent the 72 out, not the 5,000. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got to decide what is the level of my commitment to that person and what is their commitment to change? Yes. As Flo and was my saying. commitment 
is to wrap this segment up so we have lots of time for you to get some coffee and hear the testimony of my sister Flo. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You have joined a very special Sister to Sister show. You see, over the last couple of months, we've been taking turns, sharing a little bit about ourselves and our lives and mostly our testimony. So we are thrilled today to throw this last segment to the one and only Wisdom of Flow. Go. Well, let's just start with this, being very transparent. I do not like talking about myself. So this is difficult for me. So I'm gonna ask for some grace. I asked my sisters to be praying. You know, lots of times when you share testimony, um, I don't know about you, but I came up in a time where it was almost like, if you didn't have this grandiose mm -hmm. testimony, like I got delivered from a gang, I this, I that, then it was kind of like your testimony didn't count. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I think there is something there that sometimes I have to push through. The other thing is, I think I'm just basically a private person. Mm -hmm. And when you start <laughs> sharing your testimony, you also have to be cautious of who is a part of that testimony. So I'm going to do my best to stick with the points that they asked. And that was a time of pain, a time of great joy. And what I have found is that those times tend to blend together. Mm -hmm. um, my mother passed away. She was in a coma first. Uh, and of course that was very painful. Um, but the joy of watching her go through deliverance mm -hmm. as God had a man of God minister uh, to her uh, to me and I was able to take it to her and to watch God move even while she was in that comatose state. Mm -hmm. um, that part bought joy. Of course, having to release her to go home with the Lord was painful because we then had to make decisions whether to pull the plug or not. Another time of um, pain and joy every mother can relate to is giving birth, you know. Um, the pain was great, but as the word says, after the child comes forth, you forget about the pain mm -hmm. because of the joy of having that child. And so I have um, two children that have some challenges. And one of my uh, children was born with neurocystic fibromatosis. Mm -hmm. And that's when, that's why I can speak to faith versus fear. And there was a time, you know, in my life that I felt I was standing in faith for her healing, um, but really it was a denial there, mm -hmm. a fear there. And someone, because um, I was like not wanting to take her to the doctors, not wanting, and that was because I was fearful what was going to be said. And I'll never forget it, someone shared with me, no, you take her to the doctor so you know directly how to pray, where to target your prayers. Mm -hmm. And by the grace of God, she is doing phenomenally well, you know, um, I have some other people in the family who are on the autism spectrum and um, that can be very painful, but watching them come into uh, their own. Um, and I can just go on and on. The other thing for me in church was coming up in church, um, learning things about God and then learning God being in relationship with him. Um, the things that I learned about God was, we had that question about rules, the do's, the don'ts, the, you know, and, and then yet when I got to know God, it became such an intimate relationship. And I thank God for the natural father that I had because he really set me up to have this relationship with the Lord. Um, you know, the pain of um, sometimes where you're born and how things are in the world uh, can affect different people differently. And people can try to place limitations on you. The world can say, because you're this, you won't be able to do that. Or because you don't have this, you can't get that. And the grace of God, the joy of God is that for me, none of that rang true because everything somebody told me I couldn't do, mm -hmm. I was able to do it. And by the time they told me I couldn't do it, it was already being done. So there's a few pictures uh, here. I was never one to think of 
ministry in, in a grandiose manner. Ministry to me was always me fulfilling my assignment with the Lord. And so here you see I, I have a team and we're in Ghana, West Africa, and we are committing a church. This is a new church that we opened up and we're committing it and we're, 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 we're praying. Um, but I would have never seen myself doing that. Here we are here, there was a need where the children in the village needed shoes. And that's just a little quick snapshot of where we raised the money, purchased shoes, we're sitting with the chief and um, they're getting ready to give the shoes out. So the pain of c coming up into a village and watching something like you were in a National Geographic documentary, but the joy of being able to meet that need. You can continue uh, with the rest. I'm waiting on them. Then here we are, we did a pastoral conference and um, I don't have pictures of it, but we did a marital conference. Mm -hmm. And um, these are the, the, the people that were so blessed. This is me ministering to a group of pastors and which is a big change because in this cultural, uh, this particular cultural, it is a patriarchal society. And so to see the women in ministry is huge and to be received as a woman is huge. Um, this is an, another church that um, we have committed and, and, and dedicated to the Lord. We were building it up um, from the, the ground up. Now, I have always been one, my father was, and his brothers were just excellent at everything, craftsmanship, and I wasn't. So I thought I, I would love to know how to build, but God has given me how to build in the kingdom and Amen. to build people. And so here I am with a, one of Kenneth Hagin schools in, in Africa, um, and uh, I'm ministering to the, the leader of the school. They, they bought an assembly together as I was there to minister. Uh, here we are, um, I'm crying because I couldn't travel for a while, so I was sending representatives because we needed to get water to this particular village. And this is my first time seeing the actual, yeah. <laughs> so obviously I was a bit excited and very thankful for teamwork, you know, people working together. Uh, people that you can trust. This is uh, where we have acquired the property for the hospital. Um, then COVID hit, so we need some prayers for that, guys. But um, and this is uh, one of the schools that for the village of Pencra that we are committed to. And um, this is the children thanking us for what we donated and what we're doing, the work that we're doing with them. These are the pastors that, you know, in those countries, you know, to be bivocational is frowned upon because if you are a pastor, then it's like a lack of faith for you to go and work because God should be providing for you. So to come in and to address that, it was powerful because there they are filling out applications to go to school and get educated so that they can be bivocational. So my pain and my joy seemed to coincide. It's like God would, it, so what I have learned is my pain has been more of birthing pains for something else and, and growing pains. And as a result of that, when I look, and those, that's just, you know, the continent of Africa, but when I look and I didn't pull all those pictures, but you know, when I look and I can pick up the phone now and we have a group of pastors in Trinidad that are still working together, still laboring together. Um, these are things that after dealing with children and after having to release my mother and releasing my father, these are things that, and now with my husband being gone, I would have never seen myself doing, but it's not about me, right? Mm -hmm. It's all about him. Well, that's pretty phenomenal. Yes. How did you get from Pittsburgh to Africa? You know, sometimes I wonder myself, <laughs> Kathy. <laughs> That'll be part two. Yeah. That'll be Flow Demis part two. We thank you so much for being with us today for this very special edition, Flow's Testimony. Stay right there. We're going to wrap this up. So having the opportunity today to share my testimony made me think of this particular scripture, Isaiah 61 and three. And it says, to bestow on them a crown of beauty 
for a instead of ashes and the oil of joy instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. And what I have found throughout my life as you heard me say that the pain and the joy seem to run almost simultaneously uh, together. And you know, this crown of beauty instead of ashes for me has shown me that, you know, ashes come from burning something, from surrendering something, from sacrificing something. And I had to sacrifice my pain. I had to sacrifice my disappointment. And when that happened, then I believe that the beauty of the Lord began to come on me in a way that was transferable and in a way that I can impart wisdom, knowledge, understanding and encouragement to others. As I mourned for different people that had gone on in my life, to be able to now look back and celebrate and use what they have deposited into my life has given me joy. I don't have to worry about despair because the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and has anointed me to preach good news, good tidings. And so, my God is just that. He's my God. He's not a figment of my imagination. He's not some power altar in the cosmos. He is my personal God. And that is my prayer for you. Oh, I love that pain and joy run together. And I also run this one as iron sharpens iron, family. So does the countenance of a man or a woman sharpen the other? What a great testimony today. And great to have you here at Sister to Sister.